for that at some point before I go home later on today. Um, obviously, we much appreciate our sponsorship from uh, Umbro and indeed from Mike Cujo and indeed from the Professional Footballers Association. The conference obviously brought to you in conjunction with Tranmere Rovers Football Club. Um, for our newbies today, I'm Mark Clever from BBC Television and Radio here to hold it all together for you. Uh, by no means a futsal expert, but perhaps slightly better off than I was 24 hours ago. Although don't ask me any tricky questions. Um, good to have you with us, whether you're here with us at Tramir's Prenton Park or indeed you're watching online around the world uh, through the various social media networks. Again, I'm going to encourage you to please share the links because we want to maximise this opportunity for the sport of futsal. So if you are active in the social media world, please do share those links. Um, Listen, lot to live up to today because those presentations from that day yesterday, would you agree? What a fantastic day we had yesterday, you know? Antonio's presentation there on Sporting Club at Braga from Portugal. Um, talk about obviously on, on his uh, ventures in, in Thailand. And then this amazing, amazing QA yesterday afternoon where. I, I, I was, we were just talking about the, the synergy in the room with, with contributions from the States, from Croatia, from the English FA, a Premier League football manager, Spain, Portugal, Thailand, Australia. Just incredible to bring all that energy and all that experience together. Uh, and then, of course, that great gesture from uh, Futsal Focus uh, and partners in recognising Tramia Victoria's contribution to the development of futsal in England. Not to worry, by the way, if you did miss any of day one because we're going to be cutting up some video clips you're going to be able to watch that back in the future. Uh, today, wow, what a day. Uh, Keith Tozer is going to share his vision for the future. That's been kept under wraps for the last 24 hours, folks, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> Pablo Vilches is going to be here from Real Betis and uh, share with us his thoughts on uh, futsal in Spain. And obviously we're looking forward to Al's presentation as well. Al runs his own futsal centres in Australia. And then another all-star panel this afternoon, uh, in which case we're going to get to grips with the future of futsal in England. Um, without further ado, though, I'd like to uh, start as we did yesterday and uh, to welcome you officially, Stephen McGettigan from Futsal Focus, and Mark Palios, the uh, chairman of Tranmere Rovers. That's for you, that's for you. I'll talk to myself out. Thanks again, Mark, and uh, I'll just say that I'm, apologies for not being here yesterday, but I actually did watch a lot of it on the video in between sessions, uh, and, and I'd just like to say that you know, I'll just that I learned a hell of a lot, and I, I I would say looking at your programme today again, there's, there's another learning lesson here. Right? Yeah. But I've only turned up this morning just like a bad cup of coffee every morning just to say welcome to Tramway Rovers. Uh, welcome to those guys who were not here yesterday. And as I say, uh, if today's anything like yesterday, then I think it'll be good. I'm going to appear again on the um, on the question and answer panel. So uh, I, I had a quick look at the video on that and it was great. <laughs> it was, if you say, it was lively, it was good. Uh, and I think that shows an effort. It really gives a good indication of the extent of it. A few things. One is that um, just how international this is, and just how good that is, and just and that's that in itself is, is a good um, indication of how this game can actually travel around the globe. And the fact that it hasn't reached our shores yet, it's not unusual for those people who don't live on this island. <coughs> and a lot of things don't reach our shores because we, we, we've stopped it for about two thousand years, I think. And so the last one was in, in ten sixty six. Um, so there's still an element of that over here, but um, welcome to all our guests. It is over here, it is over here, it's just not to the level we want yet, just so they don't take that back, you can hear it. <laughs> no, it is over here, but I mean, I was at the FA, I was chief exec of the FA, and if I had my way, it'd be more over here yeah. than now. We knew what you meant, I just did So Mark, just stick to your role. <laughs> no, you're dead right. It is over here, and it is for us. And it's days like this that Stephen's pulled together that will help it to grow. So I just to give a welcome to everybody. I'd like to give a welcome to our guests who've come uh, from a long way. Al, Australia, it's, uh, we used to send convicts out there, by the way. Um, <laughs> and everybody in Australia, we said, it is, has the courage of their grandfather's convictions. Um, but you're, you're more than welcome here, and we will we'll, um, look forward to hearing what you have to say. 
Uh, I think the, the women's game over here, uh, Stephen and Football Focus recognised Liverpool Victoria. There were two things when I came back to Tramia that I, that, that I knew about. One was that uh, Futsal would take off. I didn't actually know to my shame about uh, Tramia Victoria. Um, but when I found out about that, I thought, yeah, I was right. Uh, and the second thing was the women's game. And over here, we also pioneered a lot of the uh, women's <coughs> football game. So the two together to me is an actual combination. So looking forward to hear that. And as I said yesterday, I'm always impressed with the way the Americans commercialise the sport. And so uh, Keith's uh, session today, I will, I will be here for it, but I certainly will download the video. Well, I'll get somebody else to download the video because I can't do those technical pieces. <laughs> um, but again, enjoy the day. Uh, I'll see you later, and I'll hope you're kind to me when I'm on the panel because I'll probably said all I know about it. So, so. Anyway, Steve, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much. Yesterday and, and when we were networking, there's a lot of people coming over and asking me a few questions and um, I thought when I'm up here I'd have a chance to address that. I'd have a chance to address that. So firstly, um, foods up, why foods are focus and why foods are? So I got involved in foods are by accident. Um, actually, it's very, very interesting how the world is so small. A person that Keith actually wanted to know since school um, introduced me to futsal in uh, Japan when I lived there. And at the time, Cardinho had just signed for the Goyuchin Futsal Club. And I went along not knowing really much about futsal at all, never really heard about it. And, um, and I'd say this massive stadium was all these futsal courts, and it was so lively, and there was people everywhere playing from all ages. And, and um, yeah, I went into the stadium and, and it was incredible. There was futsal courts under the stadium and then the stands took the thousands of people. And I was like, why have I never heard of this before? And then I had a chance to meet the chairman of the club through Tom Bayer, who is the person I was referring to that Keith has known most of his life. And Tom's an icon for football uh, in Asia, not just Japan, but Asia. And he has a real appreciation for futsal as well. So we got the chance to have some food with Yoshihito Sakurai and Tom was telling him that I'm a football fanatic and wanted to do the MBA in football industries at the University of Liverpool Management School and Yoshihito Sakurai said to me to forget about the football industry and that the future was futsal and I always remembered that. After my MBA I had the opportunity to work with Aberdeen, the Irish Football Association and with UEFA and it was at UEFA when I got to speak to more people about futsal that my interest started to increase and I wanted to learn more about the sport. And then I saw that there wasn't much promotion of it and that's why I decided to start Futsal Focus five years ago. This will be this November. What is Futsal Focus? You know, yes, it started off as news, now into conferences and it will expand into more because for me, it's the pro promotion of the sport which is most important and the education of and making people aware of the great work that a lot of people in this room is doing and a lot of people that we continue to do aren't there and those people need a voice and, and they, need to be, they need their stories to be told and, and um, I hope that you will continue to contact yourself with us to have that, that voice and for, for people to come and, and to learn about futsal around the world. I um, just want to finish by saying thank you to our sponsors um, who have helped to make this happen, Umbro, the Professional Footballers Association and Mike Fujo and uh, also to Tram Euros Football Club, to Mark Palos, Nicola Palos, and to Demon Shaw for all the hard work that everyone has done, and the other staff as well, and Hannah for sponsorship, and all the assistance that I've been given, and, uh, and to all of you for coming today. So I know you're gonna enjoy a really, an excellent presentation with Keith, and from Pablo, and from Eldon, and uh, who come uh, from America and Australia, and from Spain, and in a group uh, panel discussion, and I hope you get a lot of value out of your day here today. So thank you very much for your time and I'll pass you over to Keith. And actually just before we uh, we hear from Keith, let me just remind you of our basics. Uh, your fire exits are there, there, your toilets are there, please turn your mobile phones to silence if you would. Steve's at the back of the room for any food requirements. And uh, I know I'm a very old man but I am actually just starting to get into social media. And we did have quite a bit of interest, I thought, yesterday. So 
Please come and help me. Will you all stand up for me? Come on. And Keith, when I'm doing this part of your presentation, it's just to make people who are seeing this at home when we do this again next year. After three, one, two, three, futsal. One, two, three, futsal. Hold on a sec, I just need to make sure I look good in this. Uh, oh, you're a bit, we're a bit blurred. Very entertaining for you at home, folks, watching this online, isn't it? Hold on a sec. Hold on, hold on. We're nearly there. We're going to do this one more time. One, two, three. Futsal. I'm sure that will work. Uh, the details of the first presentation of the day are a closely guarded secret. We tried to extract them yesterday. The uh, participant wasn't forthcoming. So I'm just going to say two words to you. Keith Toza. Oh, I need for the campsite. Oh. All right. Great morning, everybody. Morning, boy. Morning. <laughs> I said great. You said what? You said good. Most people say good morning, right? Yeah. yeah. No matter what language you're in. I, I think it's a great morning because, one, I'm a very goal-oriented individual. So I reached my first goal this morning at 6.45 a.m. Does anybody know what my first goal is? To get up. Okay. Uh, which is kind of a magical thing at my age. And I think in order to be successful in sport and to be successful in business, both as a player and an executive or as a coach, you got to bring passion to the play. It's your responsibility as an executive, as a coach, as a player, to bring passion to the play. It, it's, it's a key ingredient what makes successful people. Okay, that's your responsibility. I mean, many times I've gone to uh, the training and something happened in my personal life and you bring it onto the court or the pitch and then all of a sudden your players understand it. I think the same thing happens when you're an executive in the front office is that it's your responsibilities to your employees or to your owner in order to bring that passion. So I reached my first goal. The second thing is a great morning because I'm extremely honored and proud to be in front of all of you. Some of you I've known for many, many years. Some of you I've just met yesterday. But you are the key reason why this movement of futsal is developing very quickly around the world. I, I want to say to Luciana and to Allison, to have two females in this room, along with all you fine gentlemen, also speaks wonders for the game of football and futsal for women around the world. And I think it's very important. I mean, if you look at the game of football in Sweden, as that many years ago, Pia, okay, was at the forefront of women football. And that's why Sweden, a small country, but a great country, is one of the best countries in the world for women. And I think that also with you women involved in the sport, I think what you're going to do is the same thing that happened in Sweden and America and around the world in women's soccer. So I'm extremely honored to be here. When I go through the presentation, when we come together as football people, now futsal, we're, we're very passionate, obviously, and we can get off tangent. All right? I know that when I was the head of the competition committee, for the major indoor soccer league, we'd get in a room of a bunch of coaches and we got to go through 15 different bullet points on maybe changes to the laws of the game. And after eight hours, we only got past the first bullet point. Then we realized that, you know what, we got to stay on focus. When uh, uh, Miko and I do a, a, a futsal course for instructors, it's very difficult sometimes when the new instructors try to learn because what happens is that you teach the teachers so you're not teaching men and women to be a coach to teach players. You're, you're teaching men and women in order to teach other instructors. It's a different mindset. So as I go through the presentation, I'll tell you about the PFL first, of where we were, where we are, and where we're going to go, and about the people that are involved, and about the grassroots program and the movement of futsal in the United States. I want you to kind of go through the journey with a business mind an executive mind, and not so much as the passionate coach or the player, and I think that's extremely important. So I, I'm so honored and, and, and proud to be here. I'd like to do a, a short little video about one of our events that we recently had.
Okay, uh, I know that most of you know some of my titles. Uh, I do wear a lot of hats in our country. Uh, just to go through briefly, I am the commissioner of uh, the first professional futsal league uh, in North America. I've been the head coach of the national team for 20 years. FIFA and CONCACAF futsal instructor. I'm the technical director still for United States Youth Futsal. And also, I've been 36 years in professional indoor soccer. Let me just touch on a little bit on the bottom one. Uh, I was an outdoor player, like most players uh, uh, in the country that started. They don't start in indoor, they don't start in futsal, we start outdoor. And I was uh, part of the Olympic pool in 1980, and I was getting ready to go and be drafted in the North American Soccer League. Well, indoor uh, came about in 1978. I was drafted uh, into the Major Indoor Soccer League, and all of a sudden I fell in love with the game and I was in it for many years as a player. Then I had the opportunity to go to Louisville, Kentucky to do a soccer camp for some people. And the second year I went back for the camp, there were some men and women that asked me, could you do a coach's course for parents? It's typical, I think that happens around the world, right? So I said, no problem. So I did the coach's course for the parents. Then I got a call about a month later and they said, we'd like to start a professional indoor team. Would you like to be the coach? and I was only 26 at the time. And I said, coach, I'm 26, I'm a player. I said, could I still play? And they said, yeah. So I figured as a coach, I'm gonna play all the time. So I figured that'd be pretty <laughs> smart, right? So all of a sudden, I said I, I would go. But my, my, team, my team didn't want me to go. So I went back and forth, but I did end up uh, going to the team. But the reason why I went to the team is many of my teammates prior to that made a lot of money playing indoor. But after they got done playing, they had to work jobs working 40 to 50, 60 hours a week, making a lot less money. And I thought, since I had a business degree from college, if I could become a, a coach and a player and the general manager, then maybe I can set myself up for when I'm done as a player. So that's when I really became the general manager, a coach, and a player for the team. And then as my journey continued in indoor soccer, I became senior vice president. So not only was then I was a player, I mean a coach after I got done playing, but I was responsible for up to two million dollar budget. And I did everything from travel plans, I did corporate sponsorships, I did all the, the planning for the training sessions, I did the hotel, I did per diem. I did pretty much everything that uh, someone in a professional uh, futsal or not football club would do. Um, that's brought me where I am today because I think I have a good feel for as a player, a uh, good feel as a coach, and I think I've pretty much done most of the jobs. I've done uniforms, I've done laundry, I've done everything in order to be able to push uh, our sport ahead uh, in the PFL. So what happened? How did the PFL come about? Uh, in 2014, Donnie Nelson, who's the president of the Dallas Mavericks, he called me up, he said, Keith, I might be buying an indoor team. I'd love to have you be part of it. Owner, coach, VP, whatever you want to do. And the conversation went, well, I'm under contract still with another club. However, have you ever heard of the game of futsal? And he said, futsal, what is futsal? So I explained to him, okay, especially because it was played on a basketball court, the number of players, the growth of the game. He said, wow, this sounds very interesting. I said, Donnie, I just so happened to be playing against France in my hometown, Milwaukee. Why don't you come and see what the game is really all about? 
He said, well, I can't, can't do that, but I'm going to send my daughter, Christy, to the game, and uh, then we'll talk. So Christy came to Milwaukee, and at that time was the outdoor okay, World Cup going on, and I had closed out one of the streets in my city, and we had a futsal festival. So I had a stage on one end of the street and a stage in the other with music, and we had vendor tents in the middle, and people could come and, and visit the futsal village, we called it, watch outdoor World Cup on TV, and then at seven o'clock at night, they walked one block up the street into a stadium for a free match to see the United States play against France. We had 2,500 people. It was standing room only. Uh, we lost the first match. We had the same festival the next day. We beat France in the second game. But there were so many people that loved that atmosphere of what everyone was talking about yesterday. So Christy goes back to Dallas and says, Dad, by the way, this game of futsal is unbelievable. It's playing on a basketball court, which we all know. It's uh, very exciting. It's fast. It's technical. It's everything that you would want as an executive and an owner to try to sell. Because, right, you're trying to sell a business and you need a product and a service in order to do that. And if the product and service is great, then you're halfway to become successful. So Christy says, Dad, let's bring Keith down to Dallas and let's talk about it. A month later, I'm down in Dallas. We're sitting in a boardroom, okay, uh, with Brian Dick uh, and Michael Hitchcock, who used to be president of the Dallas, uh, FC Dallas and Major League Soccer in the LA Galaxy. And from that moment, that weekend, Brian, who is the marketing guy in our group, came up with the name PFL and came up with the logo, and the PFL was born uh, that weekend. So the founding fathers of the league is Donnie Nelson, who is the president, Christy Nelson, who is our executive director of the PFL, Brian Dick, who also owns two of the companies, uh, he's president of Launchpad and Ignite One, he's a PFL league investor. Michael Hitchcock, he's our CEO. He is also a league investor. And myself, the commissioner, is also a league investor. So what we did, us four men, is we formed an LLC, a corporate entity, and we created units for each other. So we're, we're a franchise business, okay? So in 2014, which is only, you know, three years ago, the league was born. What happened in 2015 is our front office expands, okay? Uh, our front office is in Dallas, Texas. That's looking into our front door of our office. Uh, Rob Andrews joins us. Uh, many of you know Rob. He is the president of USA Futsal. He has events in Barcelona. He has events in the United States. He has the world uh, championship in Barcelona every year. So he becomes president of our international affairs. We add Aydin Saki, uh, extremely smart young man, but he is general counsel. He's our lawyer. For our league, which is an extremely important person to have in your pro league. And we add Ashley Jackson, who is our senior director of accounting. It's important for someone to watch the money as it comes in, as it goes out. Well, all of a sudden, a year later, Donnie calls us, myself, he calls Brian, he calls Michael, and he said, Mark just came up to me on the airplane and he wants in. So for the ones who don't know, Mark Cuban, who is a billionaire in the United States, who owns the Dallas Mavericks. They're on a corporate jet charter with the basketball team. And he walks up to Donnie and says, hey, I'd like to get in on this. So in 2016, Mark Cuban, who also is co-owner of 2929 Entertainment, also a lot of television shows, he comes in and all of a sudden now, the PFL front office and the league office is continuing to grow. <coughs> Well, what happens from there, do you know about the Shark Tank? It's a very highly rated TV show in the United States. Uh, there's five billionaires that sit on the panel. People that have dreams of a product or a service, they come to the show, they pitch their dream, and those investors then can then take their dream and invest in it. So it was kind of interesting that this man who is an extremely successful entrepreneur, wanted to become involved in the game of futsal, okay? Who never knew futsal. And I think that's exciting because a uh, very smart man, and obviously with money and, and connection, is really gonna help uh, the league and the sport go forward. Well, what about the PFL? How did this all start? Well, when we first got together in Dallas, that meeting over the weekend, 
We said that it will be a regional league to begin with, similar to some other professional leagues around the world, how they start. Right? We start small and we build for the future. Well, we thought we'd be in Austin, Texas, and Dallas, Texas, and San Antonio, pretty much in and around uh, the Texas area. Well, what happened from there is, I used to coach Los Angeles Lasers in the Major Indoor Soccer League. It was one of my teams, owned by the Bus family, who owns the LA Lakers. They loved indoor soccer. Okay? They got out of indoor soccer because they did not like the direction that the business was going in, but they loved the sport. So when I called Jim Buss and said, hey Jim, by the way, we're starting the PFL and it's futsal, would you like it? You know what he said? Give me two. I was like, two? He says, yeah, Los Angeles is such a big area, I would like two franchises. So I went back to Donnie and to the rest of the group and said, by the way, LA Lakers are in for two franchises. Then all of a sudden we had international teams through Rob Andrews. And all of a sudden, teams started calling us from around the world. We would like him. So all of a sudden, this journey went from being a regional league to a national league to an international league in a short period of time. I think all of you understand what an IPO is, right? All of a sudden, someone has a dream of a product or a service. You start a company, and you want to go put it on the stock market, and you look for investors. This journey has become an IPO. Because we started with a certain amount of what a franchise fee would be with. But what happened is that all of a sudden investors said, well, wait a minute, you have the LA Lakers involved? Maybe I should get involved. You have European clubs involved? Well, maybe I should get involved. You have Mark Cuban involved? Well, maybe I should get involved. So without us even playing a match now, is that our franchise fees have been keep going up, which is really what the sport of business is all about is what is your franchise worth? And we'll talk a little bit. So the pathway is we're trying to provide the best coaches, the best players, the best branding to put it all together in a league in order to push the sport of futsal. And we know not only in the United States, but to help the sport around the world. So that is us. So this is Rob Andrews right here, so we get to know everybody. He's the president of International Affairs. Brian Dick, a league investor. This is Mark Cuban, okay? This is Michael Hitchcock, our CEO, Christine Nelson, our executive director, and Donnie Nelson. So that's part of our team that we have uh, in Dallas, Texas, every day. So the question has been asking me, why, why launch the PFL? Well, one reason is, we know in life, everything's about timing. The NSCA convention, I'm sure some of you have heard in, in the United States, the National Soccer Coaches Association of America, is the largest coaching convention in the world. There's like 50,000 people from around the world, coaches, executive managers, MLS has their draft, the Women League has their draft there. Uh, it's a real big thing. Well, three years ago, when we first ramped up the PFL, we went to the NCAA convention to talk about futsal. When I used to go there as an indoor person, people knew me because of the national team, they'd come up and say, hey Keith, hey coach, Tozer, how you doing, good to see you. But you're the indoor guy. When we went three years ago, it was an amazing transformation and experience for me because people came up to me and said, hey, by the way, I heard about the PFL. Can I have dinner with you? Can, can I have lunch with you? Can I sit down and have a meeting with you? We were pretty much the buzz of the coaches convention because of the growth of futsal that was coming, that everybody wanted to know about. And what I told a lot of the vendors out on the floor and there was every vendor in the world from Umbro, friends from Umbro and Nike and Adidas and everything, is, is we said is that everybody here is selling the same product to the same demographic, right? They're selling shirts and balls and goals and, you know, computer programming to the same group of people. I said, however, futsal can sell to that same group of people, but can sell to also a different demographic, to people in the inner city, to the Latinos, to the, to the Afro-Americans, and then we can bring a different group of people to the game. That became very exciting for us. So, we thought that one of the reasons why to launch the PFL is the massive, massive growth of outdoor soccer in the United States. I think all of you understand and know the history of Major League Soccer, but that was one reason, because uh, in 1996, their franchises were a little bit more than a million dollars. 
Now, the franchise fee is north of $100 million in just 20 years. To me, that's a pretty good investment on your dollar. One of the reasons why we wanted to start the field. Over 13 million Americans are involved in futsal and football, some form of outdoor, okay, uh, which is now the third largest group in the United States, only behind basketball and baseball, which have been around in our country for over 100 years. That's rapid growth to an investor. Futsal is the authentic version of indoor soccer. I love indoor soccer. As you know, pretty much my adult life, I was involved in it. However, outdoor people look at indoor soccer a little differently than outdoor people look at futsal. And we've already had that discussion. So for us, as a league, as, as owners, as investors, they say to themselves, this is the authentic game of indoor soccer. Another reason why we should invest. The relationship that futsal has to the game, and futsal is one of the fastest growing sports in the world. I mean, I joke around that I've been trying to sell this vacuum cleaner called Footstop for 30 years, and one out of every 100 households would open the door. Now, I can't keep it in stock. Coaches, players, administrators, marketing people, media, everybody wants to know about Footstop, and it's very exciting. It's a great sport for television. That's one of the reasons why the LA Lakers wanted to get involved. Our first event in Barcelona, Jim Buss, the owner, sat next to me on the court, and he said, I never knew. This is like the NBA, but instead of the ball in the hands, the ball's at the feet. And as we know, it is a great sport for television. It's high octane, goal scoring, you know, uh, great saves, high action, tremendous futsal grassroots developing across the United States. Okay? We have academies, we have clubs, we have youth international teams, we have everything growing that you need to in grassroots. And what's kind of interesting, in 1978 when indoor soccer started, it was almost like an upside down mortgage. Do you know what that, that term means? Right? You, you owe more on your house than your house is worth. So it's upside down. Well, what happened in 1978 was indoor soccer started, there was no indoor facilities in the United States with boards. But in 10 to 15 years, three to 5,000 indoor centers then were created across our country. So the grassroots program came after the professional league started. But we're very excited is that the grassroots program for futsal and football has started before we started the PFL. So if you have your list of reasons why you want to invest, if you have a, a list of why you want to get involved in the sport, that's another tip in the, in the box that says, yes, I'm in. International teams are coming to the United States. Barcelona just opened their office six months ago in New York City. I don't know if you saw it here, but they changed the color of the Empire State Building to bark the colors at night. Uh, at the hotel, uh, one of the hotels in, in the downtown New York City, all the statues all around the hotel were barking uniforms. It was amazing. You got Bayern Munich, you got Manchester City. So you have a lot of, of the outdoor clubs that are coming to the United States to invest in the game. Another reason why our owners and other owners want to get involved in the PFL. And because futsal is an international game, okay, it brings international uh, opportunities to the, to the, to the table. Uh, there is a program in the United States, and I, I talked to Ben about it yesterday, it's called EB-5, Immigration Policy. And the immigration policy is that if a foreign uh, investor invests over a million dollars uh, into a company for a period of time, his family automatically gets green cards. Okay? So, so a lot of different reasons why the game being authentic under FIFA around the world, it's another check in the box. So we all know, and I'll go quickly to this, well, why is it better? Okay, it's a great spectator sport. Indoor sports can play in any climate. You know, a big part of our country during winter okay, is under snow. But of course, then you've got the uh, warmer areas you know, throughout the, the southwest and the southeast, okay, but still can play. 3.2 more goals per game than outdoor. A goal every six minutes and a shot every 43 seconds. No offside rules. So, again, the Americans love that. It's the mentality of fast food. 
Okay? Uh, we like everything fast and big, really. So, foot style gives <coughs> that to them. Okay? Why is it better for a store car ownership? Infrastructure is already built. One of the issues that we discussed yesterday, and then we talked about last night, is facilities. I joke in that video, and when I talk to people, is that we have more facilities than most countries in the world, because every elementary, junior high, high school, university, church has gymnasiums. But not only one gymnasium, there are schools that have <coughs> sometimes two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve gymnasiums on their complex. And their basketball courts, their volleyball courts, but what are they becoming? Woodstock courts. Okay. So infrastructure is already there. We have basketball and hockey rings. National Hockey League, we have the NBA, college basketball, college hockey, we have stadiums all over the country. And the indoor version of soccer, futsal, is weatherproof. No rainouts, no cancellations. And the portable court concept allows same day uh, arena uh, conversion. Our first event was in Dallas when we brought Barcelona, and I'll show you a couple more slides about that. But on the second day of the, the event, we took a portable court and put it out in a parking lot of one of the largest country music uh, bars in Dallas. It's famous. It's a huge parking lot. And the Dallas Mavericks were there, and they had their tents, and it was kind of like, and we played Mexico outside under the sun. And as we stood there as executives of the PFL and owners, we said, wow, an owner in an off season could take his court and go anywhere in his state on a weekend and have his promotion and bring the game to the masses instead of the masses always coming to the game. And it was a very exciting time because if you think of the trickle down effect, you got more clubs having to buy more portable courts, you had to buy more tents, you had to do more things. You'd go around the, 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 your whole state and create more sponsorships when you do that. So the, the business was extremely important in that one. The business, uh, the ability to host other events on the same day. Could you play a futsal match in the afternoon and an NBA game in the evening? Or the D League, which is the develop, developmental uh, league of the NBA. Promotional matches can be played anywhere. So again, just ticking off the boxes of why someone would want to invest in the PFL. Extremely important, we talked about it yesterday, that out of all the uh, 209 associations in the world, okay, 170 are currently uh, competing in futsal. Now remember, a lot of our owners okay, uh, are not soccer people, they're not futsal people, but in order to tell them that this many people around the world are playing, this, every confederation in the world is playing, that the millions of people that is coming through this wave of futsal is very exciting to an investor. Uh, recently, I don't know if any of you know this, okay, but uh, we were in Argentina, playing Argentina three or four times in the national team. David Potosi, who won the World Cup, okay, uh, his team, after we played him, was going to Brasilia to play Brazil in an outdoor stadium, and they had 56,000 people for a futsal match outdoor. Amazing. So, remember the one point of an investor is can you take your game to other venues in order to keep branding your team, your sport, around the country? Or in our, around the state? So, this is very exciting. So, why is there NBA interest? Well, as I said, Donnie Nelson, he called me up and he said, do you want to get involved? And his quote was, our vision is to build an authentic product of the court and the quality affordable entertainment in the state, <coughs> giving companies an effective platform to market their product and services while doing our part to build the game of futsal and giving back to each community. I love the quote because the quote is kind of aimed at the business side of the sport. Is what is our responsibility to the owners that come in? What is the responsibility to our fans? What is the responsibility to the sport of futsal in itself? So this is Donnie Nelson, as I said, he's the president of the Dallas Mavericks. Mark, I couldn't be more excited about partnering with an investment in the PFL. Futsal is one of the fastest growing sports in the world, and it's time to make it even bigger in the U.S. market. 
We are ready to introduce the best global brands and the world's best players to our growing fan base, and I'm thrilled to be part of the PFL. And again, I think many of you know him, NBA champion, uh, renowned entrepreneur, and a self-made uh, billionaire. Jim Buss, president and owner of uh, the LA Lakers, being part of the league with prestigious international brands and innovative NBA minds, an incredible opportunity. I can't wait to bring the game to Los Angeles. So now all of a sudden, you have a president of an NBA club, you have one of the biggest owners in the NBA with uh, the Lakers and one of the biggest other owners with Mark Cuban, and now the sport is taking off. Another reason NBA interest. NBA, NBA owners have a great understanding and history of the business of sport. Some NBA owners also own other teams. Okay, Some of them own NFL teams or part owners of NHL teams. But what's exciting is they have a great background into the mechanics of the sport industry. You have television potential, investment potential, growth of the game globally, and futsal is similar to basketball, which makes them comfortable with the court size, the number of players, fast-paced action. And it's wonderful that Kobe Bryant, who grew up in Italy, who loves Milan, but he also loves Barcelona, is that he's out there playing futsal. And there's many players in the NBA that part of their warm-up before they go on the court, similar to NHL players, they juggle a futsal ball or a soccer ball. And now we have sports celebrities uh, that are becoming investors in other sports, and you'll see that down the road. So Kobe loves it. And also content for basketball arenas. Because basketball obviously is paid, uh, played during uh, the winter months and into early spring, but then their stadiums during the summer have concerts and other events. It's another opportunity for our investors. So what are the three main reasons, okay, uh, and sources of income that a professional team can bring? Well, net profits on sales of ticket, television rights, and sponsorships surrounding game day experience. So we sat down as a league, as an owners, and said, okay, what do we need for ticket sales? What kind of sponsorship money can we bring in? What kind of other revenue through television rights can we bring in? In the PFL right now, we have several different committees. We have a competition committee. Obviously, laws of the game, how many games are gonna be played, so on and so on. Some owners sit on that, some executives in our front office sit on that. We have an expansion committee that Mark and Jim sit on. We have a, a sponsorship committee. And we also have uh, uh, another committee just to deal with marketing of the league. So all the owners are actively involved along with the management of the PFL in the different committees of the league. The sale of your franchise or a percentage of your franchise is another exciting way in order to make money into the sports business. So all of a sudden, I buy a PFL team, I go to Micho, so Micho, would you like to invest in the company? I love futsal, okay? How much do you want? 10%, 15%, okay? And then I go to Steven. Steven, I have a, a professional futsal team. Would you like to invest? So that's another way in order for a team and a league to build is through individual investors with an investor that started an actual team. Merchandising and licensing, extremely important. I love the way that the National Football League, MLB, which is baseball, National Hockey League, I love how they brand their sport. Every piece of article that's sold by every team in the league must have the league logo on it. Because the individual teams are not strong unless the league is strong as a collective group. So all of a sudden, if you want to sell your jersey, you want to sell hats, you want to sell shoes, you, whatever you want to sell in your club, you must have the PFL logo on it. It's extremely important for the growth of the game. Okay? So merchandising and licensing. Licensing is going to be an extremely important factor in this. So for instance, if someone wants to sell soccer balls, they pay the league a certain amount of money, they become the, uh, maybe the official ball, or just in licensing uh, of that ball, they have to have the PFL logo on it, and every ball that's sold, a percentage of the ball goes back to the PFL. So you have to really protect your brand, <laughs> the name of your league, as well as the name of your team, in order to build the business. 
Although net profits and merchandising can be lucrative, the, the place most sports franchises profit from is their valuation. Is how much you pay for it, how much you work hard in order to build not only your own team, but the league, which is extremely important. Because you could have the best team in the league, and you could be great, and the other 10 teams are not too good, and then the league is not going to be as well, and your valuation goes down. So it's extremely important as the valuation of your franchise soars, okay? Your investors then obviously are going to stay with you. So with that, you spend money each year on your mortgage in order to keep your house. And I explained this concept to someone the other day, is that all of a sudden I move into a neighborhood and I spend X amount of dollars for my house. So let's say I spend 350, but the house is only 300, but we really wanted it. But then another person comes in and they spend a little bit more for their other house. And then that keeps multiplying. So all of a sudden, that house in that community is worth a lot more so that when you're able to sell, you make money on it. It's similar to the sports and that. So franchise evaluation, every American sport franchise owner hopes to capitalize on this phenomenon when receiving their franchise valuation and soliciting other prospective owners and other groups rather than focusing on cash flow. It's pretty interesting. A lot of the clubs don't make money per year. Some of them lose money. However, their valuation continues to grow at a rapid pace. And let me give you some examples. The first one, New York Mets, purchased by the uh, Wilpin Tax Group in 2002 for $391 million. So that's in 2002, 15 years ago. They are now worth $1.6 billion. That's Major League Baseball. National Football League, New York Jets, 2,635. They are now worth $2.7 billion. NBA, Mark Cuban, bought the uh, Mavericks, $285 million. The Mavericks are now $1.4 billion. And last, the New York Islanders, $130 million. And now they're worth $325 million. So again, the valuation of your franchise through the work that you do as an individual owner, as, uh, as your league does, is that's how we feel that the valuation process will then multiply. We also feel that if we do our job correctly, that we can help the valuation of franchises maybe around the world. And it goes the other way. The more successful professional leagues and franchises are around the world, the more that it will help the evaluation of the PFL. Because again, we're all tied together in this, in this venture. Now, you can have great coaches, you can have great players, but if you don't have a team or if you don't have a league that's successful, then the sport won't continue to grow. So again, collectively. So, what was our history? We talked about who we were and what was our game plan. We strategically sat down and said, if we're going to launch this league, we need to do a wow factor. Because remember, we went from regional to national to international. And if we're going to be an international uh, professional league, how can we make our mark? Well, we all know that everyone talks about Barcelona. So uh, Rob Andrews works at Barcelona, and we said, would Barcelona come to Dallas? And we'll put on an event. So we created Team USA, which was not the national team. A lot of national team players, but it was Team USA and Team Mexico. So Barcelona sent over their B team. Okay? Uh, we only had four weeks to sell this event out, which we weren't nervous about. However, in the PFL, and I think in any business that's successful, you need a long runway. A long runway, what I mean in business is you come up with an idea. You then put a business plan together. And then you put your action items together. Then you need a long period of time in order to sell what you're trying to sell. It seems like a lot of business people come up with an idea on a Monday, and they try to open it up on a Friday, and they fail on a Sunday, and they're out of business. But we only had four weeks to put this together. We sold out the building in Dallas, the Dr. Pepper Arena, close to 5,200 people, and it was an exciting moment. ESPN broadcasted a lot. Uh, it was a fantastic game, 4-3, Barcelona won. 
But so many people that knew about futsal who came from around the world to see the game had a wonderful time. But it was the people that watched that on YouTube, that the kids maybe played, but it's really not futsal. When they saw this up close and personal, me walking around the stadium was an unbelievable moment because we all said, wow, this is going to be fantastic. And as I said, Jim Buss from the Lakers sat next to me, and he's watching the game, and he's ducking, the balls are going past him, and he just said, this is going to be a great investment. So, the largest futsal crowd in U.S. history. <coughs> Our second event, Supercopa. We said, okay, we brought one of the most recognizable teams in the world. How do we bring one of the most recognizable players in the world? And why? Well, we knew obviously people would love to watch Falcao play. But how much is it worth to have our logo, our the most recognizable player in the world, our logo on his jersey with Falcao? We felt that if we could have that event, that it would show people around the world that we are for real. And we all know in business that branding is one of the most important things. So we reached out to Falcao and said we have this idea, which he absolutely loved, and we said that we want to have a combine and invite players from around the country who wrote into the PFL, that we read their resume or their CV and said, okay, come to Orlando, and out of the 150 players, we would pick 10 to play on the team folk out. Pretty amazing, because when players came from around the world, a week or a month prior to that, they never thought the player from Australia, the player from New Zealand, the player from Boston, Massachusetts, the player from San Jose, Costa Rica. They never thought in their wildest dream they'd play along who? Or play against who? Felca. And again, that became another magical moment for the PFL and for the game. So, Felca came down, we played at the ESPN Wild World of Sports, which is on the uh, campus of uh, Disney World, and, and, and it was a magical moment, uh, and we played against uh, a team from uh, Australia, Fremet, which was a very, very good team. So it was a great, great opportunity. And as we know, Falcao is not only a great player, but he's been a great ambassador to the game of futsal. Well, what are we gonna do next? Again, strategically planned, Remember, we said about timing is extremely important in business. How do we ramp this thing out and make a wow factor? And one of the reasons why we did the event is to brand our, our name in the league, is to see what kind of investors there would be out there, to see how the media would react to the game of futsal coming to North America. So, now we know the best player in the world is Ricardinho. And Antonio driving over in a taxi said, that Falcao last night scored another one of those amazing goals that is out on Facebook. I haven't seen it yet. But we asked that Ricky if he could come to the United States and he said one of the reasons is my friend Falcao is coming to the United States. I would like to be part of what the growth would be in the United States. So we had to come up with a game plan. How could we come up with the entertainment capsule around this event? So we all know that social media and uh, live streaming is extremely important to your business. So we decided to come up with PFL Next. Who would be the next player that would join the PFL vision? So what we did is we started a campaign that players from around the world could send their videos into the PFL of them doing some scoring goals or them playing so that we would then put that together. We had over 800 players from around the world sent in videos to the PFL uh, office. So what we thought is, we create Team PFL, a Team uh, Falcao, and Team Ricardinho. The All-Stars represented 10 different countries from around the world and generated an estimated total of 2.2 million online impressions of people around the world looking at this event. And again, it was all about branding. So, out of the 800 or so contestants, we came down to 25 players. Out of those 25 players, Falcao 
Ricardinho and our team in the front office, then got it down to 10 players. Those 10 players were flown from around the world, all expenses paid. They stayed uh, in Animal Kingdom, along with Ricardinho and Falcao, and they were treated how they should be treated as a professional player. What was amazing to me is that these young people, and by the way, Tanya, who plays professionally in Italy, is a wonderful player, a woman player, and she was awesome. And it was amazing how the men and her bonded so quickly together, and she played so great. But as all the players were sitting in the lobby of the Animal Kingdom, when Falcao and Ricardinho walked into the lobby, how those two men greeted them, as if they were teammates, okay, on their own team. It was an amazing experience watching this transformation. And again, our investors were there, our league officers were there, and we kept looking at each other it's like, wow, this thing is continuing to grow. So these young players then came to the United States, and this is a picture from our training session. And to watch those players play with Ricardinho and Falcao, which is really in Disney World where dreams become a reality, okay, was, was unbelievable. We have Al Abrams, as we all know from Australia. He coached uh, the Team Falcao team. Uh, and it was amazing to have him because so many people know him around the world. And we thought it was very important to bring in a coach that everybody knows around the world. So what was great is that we had uh, Al with Falcao and we had Wilbur Arau from Team Ricardinho. So what we did is, once we got the 10 players down, okay, we took them to Epcot Center. Does everybody know what Epcot is? Okay, in Disney World. We rented out the Great Hall of China for a 200 person cocktail party and dinner. But during that event, we had the PFL draft. So similar to like the NBA or the NFL draft, we had Ricky on my left and Falcao on my right. And then like we did in the NBA, we went through the process. Falcao picks in the first round of the PFL draft from Australia, so and so. And then Rick Rubidino did it and Falcao did it. So we actually had a draft of the players after the training session. And then we went outside and the fireworks at Epcot Center and then the next day was the game. Next day, sold out arena. 2,500 people. And as Al can, can contest that it was an amazing moment, people were so excited, people actually got to see you know, their idols, Falcao and Ricardinho, players got to play with them, the media was there, it was just a wonderful event, the game was great, and even Kaká came by to say hello. And it was an amazing thing because for Kaká to come by, who's friends of Falcao, but he loves Woodstock. And when all the fans were there and the media was there and all of a sudden Kakao walks into the stadium, everybody's like, there's Kaká, there's Falcao, there's Ricardinho. How do I buy a franchise? <laughs> it was great. So currently in the futsal markets, and what are what is the futsal market in the United States, has been growing at a rapid pace, not only in the largest metropolitan cities across the US, but is it beginning to show substantial growth in many of the suburban and secondary markets. Because of the growth, the business opportunities, not only for Division I, but also plans, and we say it in the parking lot, so we have an idea, but it's behind us right now, for Division II, PFL, Division Three, and also a professional league for women. But what has hold true in North America regarding the cities or states with the most growth in outdoor soccer, is holding true for the futsal market. And what are those? And what is the criteria in order to have a PFL team in your city? The most important thing at the end of the day, and no disrespect to the players, and no disrespect to the coaches, no, is the strength of your ownership. Does your ownership have the vision and the financial capabilities to sustain his uh, monetary value for a period of time, so the valuation of the franchise continues to grow. So number one, strength of ownership. Strength of the market, and the quality of your arena. Those are the first three things in the PFL that we look at in order to bring an investor in. And what are the markets? 
These top 10 cities are the top 10 in, in, in population. The next 10 are the next 10 cities in population. As you can see, they're major cities in, in the United States, the next three, and then also Canada and Mexico. So what would the footprint look like? This is what the footprint would look like. So as you can see, you know, the west coast, southwest, south, southeast, north, and midwest are where the major metropolitan cities are and are quickly becoming our PFL markets for the uh, present and then also for the future. And some of the grassroots program that we talked about that's exciting for the game in the United States is U.S. Soccer proclaimed several years ago that futsal would be part of our players' youth development. I know that Angel, who was the president of Spanish football when we were there for a FIFA conference uh, for instructors, uh, and Spain was the world champion at the time, and we were in La Rosa, and the trophy was next door in the museum. Angel, who opened the conference to 65 passionate futsal guys, he said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Spain. He says, uh, when you're here, I hope you get your picture taken with the World Cup trophy next door. But one of the reasons why the World Cup trophy is over there is many years ago in Spain, we decided that futsal would be part of our players' youth development. And then a Brazilian guy was sitting next to me, and he elbowed me, and he goes, the other reason they had, they were sick of Brazilian beating them all the time. But again, U.S. soccer, and this has been a big shot in the arm for our game, is so that our federation said that futsal would be part of it. This, this really pushed the growth of the game forward. Our DA program, Developmental Academy, which is each major league soccer team has a DA program, and also there's other DA programs in the country. During the transitional months of February to March, they all must touch and play futsal. Now, those DA programs have eight to 10 futsal showcases around the country, Philadelphia, Chicago, Miami, Dallas, LA, during the winter months. The United Soccer Coaches used to be called the NSCA, two months ago changed their name. They've embraced futsal. And in Baltimore, we had our own PFL booth, which was visited by over 2,000 people while we were there. Can I play this real quick? When I play this video, it's only two minutes long. Can you hear back there? Substitute baseball for futsal. Put some. Thank you. 
almost definitely come. Ray, you will lose everything. You will be evicted. I wanted to show you that clip because we're all raised. This young man, Dragon, from Moldavia, he's trying to put together a facility in a city with a dome with four facilities. And there's going to be times where someone is going to say, Dragon, you can't do that. And you got to remember where you came from and where you're going. And I think that's extremely important because when we opened up this talk, we talked about passion. And we're going to have a lot of doors closed in our journey to grow the sport. We all know that. It's already happened. But I wanted to show that to you is that you're going to have to make that defining decision in your life. No means go. And I'm so proud that we're all together in this room for this first futsal business conference in order to push the sport further. You have a soccer now. Uh, build it and they will come. Target, one of the largest corporations in our country, just partnered with U.S. Soccer Foundation, which is the charity arm of U.S. Soccer, to build 100 futsal courts across the, uh, the country, the United States. City government, MLS, charities, soccer clubs, private institutions, and futsal clubs are renovating underutilized outdoor tennis courts, warehouses, and other occupied facilities in the futsal courts. This is in New York City, the before and after. It's kind of amazing through this journey that everywhere I look, Every parking lot, every piece of concrete, every piece of land, I see a futsal court. And facilities, as you know, is extremely important to the game, but it's extremely important to the business model. So I decided that I personally wanted to give something back to the city where I've been for the last 25 years. So the dream was what would my court look like? And when I did this court, I wanted to be able to do as much as I personally can instead of just signing a check in order for when people ask me, how did you do it? And Stephen and I, Stephen's got dreams to build one in Ireland. I could tell people, this is how it was actually done. So quickly, this is what this court looked like a year and a half ago. I went to my city and said, by the way, I took a mental log of driving back and forth and I see no players. And I don't like to use the word never. I see no players playing tennis on the court. I'd like to change it in the futsal. This is my city government. They said, futsal, what's that? Kind of like Donnie. I had a PowerPoint presentation. They said, interesting. So they said you could do it. So I had to come up with the business plan. What would it cost me? And at the press conference, it was easy. It was 20,000 square feet. It was 200 by 100 with four tennis courts. I just said, oh, let's just power wash it and clean up the cracks and paint it. And voila, I got futsal. Well, I first had to come up with the business plan. Power washing, the resurfacing, what the futsal goals would cost me, the prepping and securing of the goals, the paint for the two courts, my business plan. So, the first day I went out to try to power wash. I did about uh, 10 feet in three hours. I was like, oh my god, I got 19,994 feet to go. <laughs> so, next player of mine drove by and said, Coach, with that little power washer, you're going to be there for 10 years. So, he brought two industrial power washers. So, we had to do that. Then, we had to fix the cracks and pound out the concrete. We went through two sledgehammers. Then they had to prime it, line it, paint it, and now all of a sudden that dream, build it and they shall come, is a reality because after our press conference, it looks like that. And build it, they shall come is that people walk out of the court from the inner city, from the suburban, and they go play futsal. Now it's pretty amazing that over here, there used to be trees, and to cut a tree down in a city park takes an act of God. And I said to them, is there any way, because these trees are dropping stuff on the court, 
It's going to ruin it, so I'm going to sell it. Over here in front, 17,000 cars pass the facility every day. So in order to generate revenue for this dream, we then started selling these piece, these banners, which are 10 feet by 5 feet, for $1,000 per year. The ones on the side and in the back, they're $500. The flag that you see is 1000 and we even have court details. So we needed to generate revenue in order to build that. We also went to city government, and you can do this in your city, possibly, is that we went to city government and they have a matching fund. They said, if you put up 10, we'll put up 10. You put up 15, we put up 15. So the city came back. Well, we went to get voted on to see if it actually would pass through. The head of the uh, supervisor committee said, does anybody have any questions for the coach before we vote? And all of a sudden, the guy on the south side of the city says, hey, by the way, I've got tennis courts. You can do And the guy on the west side says, hey, by the way, I've got tennis courts. They can do So whatever country you're in or city you're in, go find some land that's not being used and try to find a way, because build it, they shall come. Now we have kids, Latinos, half American, suburban kids, everybody using the court. So, also, grassroots program. We have academies that are starting all over our country. Futsal academies. These are just some. ABK, Grand Rapids, Rose City in Portland, Elite, Salt Lake, Barefoot, Charlotte, WSG in Milwaukee, these other five. But I wanted to single off one. And all these, do an unbelievable job. But if you look at the academies, do you see what cities they're in? They're in where? Potential PFL markets, which is exciting because every PFL franchise must have an academy program. What does that represent? Just think that the PFL is gonna have opportunities for coaches, for players, for administrators, for investors, for academies, for physios, so opportunities uh, will be all over. So, but the one that I wanted to single out is City Futsal from Dallas. Okay, Peter, you know City Futsal very well. Okay, and what are they all about? Well, it's a futsal space and community anchored by a futsal club called uh, City Futsal FC, and they participate in U16 through U17. Um, they're owned by the Mariel family. They're originally from Santos, Brazil. And they created a program called FDSP. Has anybody heard of that? Futsal Development Soccer Program. The reason why they put soccer in there is why do you think? What? Marketing, right? More appealing, so it wouldn't shut off the outdoor person. So Futsal Development Soccer Program, I think it started for the first four months. It was thousand dollars you train three days a week now their FPSP program is 12 months long it's four thousand dollars and they have a hundred kids in the program and that's just one of their programs they've done a tremendous job of doing futsal development okay they establish leagues okay, and tournaments and now they're building courts and this is happening across the United States this was their first facility this has eight courts, their second facility, and this is going to be in downtown Dallas, okay, uh, in a park system, an outdoor covered open. What is the landscape of futsal in the United States right now? We don't have a pyramid yet, but we have these entities, okay, that are part of U.S. soccer. Some are through affiliates, some are direct. But we have USA Futsal, which is run by Rob Andrews, who's the president of our international affairs. Rob is tournament-based. So he has tournaments in Barcelona, he has a tournament in Orlando every year. So he's part of the landscape. Then you have USFF, United States Futsal Federation, which just recently changed their name to US Futsal. They're directly associated with US soccer, so they pay a high fee and then their director, Alex Paris, sits on the board of U.S. soccer. Then you have United States Youth Futsal, which I'm still the technical director. They're associated with U.S. soccer, but they're associated through another entity called U.S. Triple A, and they're a member of U.S. soccer, but still U.S. Youth Futsal is a member of U.S. soccer. And just recently, AAU, which is basketball, got into the game of futsal, and they're one of the largest basketball uh, outfits and City Futsal has partnered with them. So, just quickly, USU Futsal, 
They're pretty much focused on youth. They have national ID programs, which it used to be a regional thing for their national ID, where there was four regions, hundreds and hundreds of players would go, train for four or five days. They were then rated one, two, and three. All the ones that were sent to Kansas City for the national ID, from there they were rated again, and from there was born the international team for a period of year. Now, we have 25 state IDs, so the regionals dropped. So 25 states have their ID camps, over 100 players in each state. They're rated and evaluated. The number ones then go to Kansas City. Again, 450 players. Train again for five days by our national staff and referees program. Then they make the international team. And just recently, we came back from Costa Rica with the U14, 16, and 18 boys and girls, and out of 18 games, we won 16 of them. So they did quite well. But as you can see from 14, we went to Canada, Costa Rica, the 14, 16, and went to Colombia. Okay? So again, the grassroots program for our professional league. They do coaching education. So I helped them out with coaching education. We call it a level four, which is a one, and a level three, which is a two. But we're starting with coaching education across the country. And they also have a regional and national championship, similar to U.S. Futsal. CONCACAF, just last month, just started the Champions League, so it's a club championship. Uh, a team out of Utah, which is pretty much a lot of Brazilian players, uh, won that championship. Uh, it's actually, the Utah team came in second. Uh, Costa Rica won that, that tournament. Uh, so now CONCACAF is Champions League, and I think UEFA is now taking the UEFA Cup and change it into the Champions, right? Champions League. Champions League. Puts all Champions League. Puts all Champions League. So, so. so uh, I want to thank Stephen, who, again, as he said, I met five years ago online, Skype. Um, and he told me about his dream, and his dream is reality. I sat here yesterday so proud of this young man who I know has had doors closed, right? You were raved many times, right? as similar as I, and to see you yesterday, to look out among all these people, I, I think we, I'd love to give Steve a round of applause. <laughs> I'd like to also thank uh, Mark Kalios, the owner, chairman of Tremor, uh, Tremor Rovers, uh, for his vision for hosting us here. I think it's unbelievable. Steve, uh, who I first met, first person in Liverpool, uh, picked me up at the airport. He's been awesome. Damon, who I've known for years, and Sean, that Micho here, and, and Al, the meat Ben, and Pablo, and Antonio, and the rest of you, has been an unbelievable experience for me. Extremely part, uh, proud to be part of your world. Mark, I thought you'd done an unbelievable job. I'd like to get Mark in there. <laughs> so, want to have any questions, or we don't have time? No, we can do questions. Oh, we got time. <laughs> Um, well, I think first of all, yeah. uh, I kind of, uh, I'm trying to express what you just told us in body language because <laughs> the words are obvious but not obvious. Did you lot know this? Did you all know this? A lot of you knew this. Some of you? I mean... Sorry, just take me back because I, I was settling up and then I'm going to ask if anybody's got any questions. The germ, the inspiration for those embryonic steps in 2014. You know, a bit like some of the things we heard of with the head of the Portuguese FA with Antonio yesterday. Can, can you just tell us again how this ball got rolling? Well, again, when Donnie called me and wanted to start an indoor team, but... Again, I want to make, because we're broadcast around the world, I, I love indoor soccer. It's done so much for, for me as a man, for my family and everything. But the path is only within the United States. There is other indoor around the world. But the game of futsal, as we said, is the authentic game. I, I loved it as a player. Okay? I love coaching it. I, I'm an atypical guy, if you haven't figured it out. So for me to be on the sidelines, it fits my personality. I, I love the game because the action's there, the people involved. The, the game of futsal has brought together such wonderful people. It, just towards referees, futsal people, it, it's a different mindset 
So when Donnie came and said, let's do it, I can remember walking into his office so nervous at 57 years old because I knew who he was and what he represented to see if this could really catch on. It was, it was, it was an epiphany. It was, it was a magical moment and it still is today. I understand why you got the call because of your credentials. Yeah. Do you, did you ask him how he came to make that call and who had gone to him? Christy, elicited Christy, Christy, gotcha. Christy, his daughter, who came to Milwaukee, who, uh, and actually Rob Andrews was the first time I met him. He came to Milwaukee to watch the game. She went back to her father and to Mark and said, Dad, this game of futsal is unbelievable. So Christy, you know, she, she played a big role in the start of the PFL because without her going back to her dad and saying, by the way, that France game against the United States was wonderful, we probably wouldn't be. I'm, I'm, I'm laboring this because I do see the synergy with the stories we heard yesterday. I just mentioned Antonio's. That from a starting point, very quickly, I know you haven't started actually playing yet, but very quickly, momentum can build and the landscape can look totally different, Keith. Yeah, and that's one thing that I'd like to tell everyone in this room, and Micho and some of us were talking, but Stephen knows and Damon, is that. Us futsal people want it to happen yesterday. And people around the world will say, well, they came out with the Super Bowl, but they had Rick or they had Falcao. When are they going to start? When are, they gonna, are they for real? Okay. I think people understand how large our country is. I think we understand as a league the responsibility that we have, that when we open the door, we need to open the door the correct way. Because you only have one opportunity to open that door. So the things that we're working on is core production. We, we want to produce the best futsal court for our owners and then become a business play, a product that we could sell around the world. Uh, we have not one referee, and let me repeat, we do not have one referee in the United States that has ref a professional futsal match at a high level. Well, if you want to start yesterday and you have some of the top players in the world on the court and they don't know how to manage the game through the laws of the game, what is the media going to say? Why do you call that? Why do you do that? Uh, uh, television rights, player contracts. The, my, my action item list is over 400. So the PFL is for real. Okay? You know your journey in Thailand. There, there are so many things that you need to do. And what I love about the PFL ownership group is that they're business people to say, no, we wait. We'll, we'll open the door when the door is ready to open. Although, of course, you know, with the sort of pockets that are involved in this investment, I guess they do have the ability to be able to do that. They can take a slightly more strategic approach. Sure. There'll be some guys here a little bit closer to the cold face needing to see some sort of return on our action straight away on their endeavors. Any questions or anybody like, yeah, please. Well, first of all, absolutely mind-blowing for you. Um, my question is, what can we expect in 2018 with regards to an actual league commencing and how your future and thoughts are around that? Because obviously everybody's thinking that the PFL is going to be a league and uh, obviously with the timeline, with the other confederations, uh, campaigns, Great question, Sean. Uh, strategically, we mapped out how the logo was going to look, what our event at the NCA was going to look. We had a timeline of our events with Falcao and Ricardino. So the reason why we did those events was in order to brand who we were. Right now, in 2018, we will probably not have an event because we are deep, knee deep, in the logistical part of the business to get everything going. We felt that people know us around the world for the PFL. Okay? I think people understand and coaches know and players know and rest who we are. Now we're knee deep because remember, we're selling franchises. So when you buy a franchise, we have to make sure that we give you a manual, we give you courts, we give you the academy program, we give you everything. So in 2018 is more of a logistical year to make sure that we get everything together. Our new website just came out, another new website will be going out. Uh, within the next six months, so it, it's all gearing up in order for that one day that we say we're launching and we're going. Thank you, Sean. Miko, good morning. Thank you. 
So, <coughs> are you going to change the laws of the game of pizza? And how to avoid problems with FIFA in this game? My FIFA colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my friend. <laughs> uh, when I used to watch futsal matches on YouTube as a coach, I never looked into the stands. I looked at the play in the court. I looked at the coach, how he managed the game. Now when I look at a game on YouTube, the first thing I look at is how many people are in the stands and what kind of advertising is around. There's sometimes I watch football games and there are a lot of people in the stands. Or there's only two or three hundred. We're talking about stadiums that have eight, 10, 12, 15,000 people. So we sat as a group in the BFL and said, how could we tweak the game in order to make the game a little bit better for our audience. The game right now is average an hour and 43 to an hour and 45 minutes long. For television in North America, you need a two hour product. So we said, how could we get the game to two hours? So we discussed, instead of two times 20, four times 12. So that would add eight minutes to the game. What would that do? That give you four periods where between the first and second and the third and fourth, you have three minutes, you can do what? People can go to the concession area, people can buy beer, people can buy food, people can buy your hats, your shirts, your jersey, your shoes, which would make your sponsors quite more happy. Your dancers could come out, your sponsors of that, whatever you could do uh, is would be better. So we, we talked about that. And as Miko knows, someone inside FIFA said to me, okay, when I was in Columbia, by the way, and I was like, oh, well, here it comes. We're looking at doing the same. So we have discussed to extend the game a little bit longer. People in America love timeouts. There's two minutes to go in the game, all of a sudden there's a restart outside the penalty arc. And maybe you don't have a left-footed player, maybe your players have been out too long, all of a sudden the coach doesn't have a timeout. Can you imagine if all of a sudden there's a timeout and your best left-footed player now can come on the court? What else you can do? You can go to, to a TV timeout, they go to a commercial. So we were talking about extending the game for two hours. We also talked about some other rule changes, uh, like no tackling. Uh, I was, two, two or three years ago, there was no tackling in futsal. Did you know that? Yeah. And then we changed the laws of the game to bring tackling in. And I said, well, why don't we bring this beautiful game to show these wonderful technical players and now we're going to be able to bring tackling into the game. And it was told to me that so that the rule books of football and futsal are similar. Not many players tackle, but if you've been to the Super Copa, you've been to some the World Cup games, the games, the games are physical. In America, and I don't know if you have this in England or the countries you're from, but workman's compensation, so when an employee gets hurt, it's kind of like car insurance. The more you wreck your car, Mitchell, the more your insurance goes up. So the more a player gets hurt, the more your workman's comp goes up from the state, and it's a law that you must have it. It can go as high as a million to two million dollars, depending on how many injuries you have. So we felt if we bring the best players in the world over, and they're constantly getting tackled and hurt, and the workman's comp claims go up, that that can hurt the sport. So those that's a rule that we might take away. But to really get to, to what you want to know is from day one, I said, as a FIFA person, as a U.S. soccer, as a, a national team uh, coach for 20 years, we must be part of FIFA, we must be part of our federation, and we must be part of this global gro growth of the game around the world. Last couple. Any more, please, for Keith? Any more questions? You can. Let me go up the back here, just for a second. I can only imagine. <laughs> well, you stop there if it's all right. I'll just walk up. And it's going to be a referee question. No, it's not, Keith. Can I ask, how do you, in America, as an Englishman, I see rich kids playing football. Yeah? How have you got the kids in the Bronx, is it, or the lesser regions involved in your program? I absolutely love your question, by the way. That's one of the things that we have talked about in the futsal movement in our country, is how do we take the inner city kid, that unbelievable athlete, and get him involved in the game of futsal. 
it really was in the game of football because in 1994 when the World Cup came, in 95 the U.S. Soccer Foundation was born and the U.S. Soccer Foundation said we're going to build outdoor pitches in the metropolitan cities around the country. As you know, land is very sparse. If you do get land, it's very expensive. And if you do build a field, it's very hard to maintain it. And will you get 20 some odd kids to play? So all of a sudden, several years ago, they started building mini pitches, futsal courts, in the inner city, which you have a ton of space to do. It has now opened a different demographic to the game of futsal, which then will go to football. So we are, like I showed you there, U.S. Soccer Foundation, Target, individuals like myself, uh, other charities are, are going to the inner city, are building these futsal courts, and I think it's going to really revolutionize the demographic for our game, both with futsal and also football. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks for your question. Good morning. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. Um, just one question. You are planning when Division 1 and Division 2, Division 3, are you planning promotion regulation system between divisions? And if so, how are the owners of the club uh, that are in close leagues without promotion regulations would uh, receive these proposals? We will not be doing uh, relegations or uh, promotion. It, it's not in our in our makeup of, of the Americans. Okay, we, we haven't grown up with it. We don't understand it. And for a business person to spend millions of dollars on a franchise, and you have bad years, right? I mean, no matter what, right? Yep. And all of a sudden, you drop down to a second division. It's just not the mentality uh, in our country. However, <laughs> I take the story of the Orlando. Uh, team in MLS. They started as a PDL team. The PDL team then went into a USL team. So they went from basic semi-pro to second division and now they're at MLS. So they have gone up through promotion through what? Business success. So we feel that we maybe might have secondary markets that are there because A, maybe the ownership group doesn't have the investor group maybe the population, maybe the size of the facility, but over courses of, of years, invest, investment goes up, he builds a new stadium, his crowd gets bigger, and now he gets promoted to the first division through business, not through the ability on the court. But without relegation in that case. Correct. Just if you lose money, you're not gonna go down. But it's just not, it's just not in our makeup for that. MLS doesn't do it, there's been talk of them doing it. NASL recently came out with a statement that they're going to start looking at that program, but as far as the PFL is concerned, we, we have not discussed it. Absolutely fascinating, absolutely mind blowing. I'm sure you're going to ask me a lot of questions as you, as you see him over the course of the day. I'm going to set you a challenge. We're going to be talking about uh, England and how we develop futsal and things, and we'd, we'd surely appreciate your contribution to that debate a little bit later. In fact, I want a uh, three, five, six point plan of what we should do with the resources we've got to start to kick us on the way, okay? No pressure there. That's, uh, that's, that's item number four of what we have to do list, if we can. Um, Pablo Vilches from Real Betis will be here from 11 o'clock. I'm going to give you a 12 minute coffee and tinkle break if you're watching online. Uh, then you can either stay with us or rejoin us then. In the meantime, the biggest round of applause possible for a fascinating...